Hello everyone, my name is Daily Manwas and welcome to another video. In this video I will be recapping this manwa called Foreigner on the Periphery. I hope you enjoy the video. This story begins with a man sitting in the doctor's office. The man told the doctor that his job was very boring and always drove him crazy, and he asked if there was a way to live without working. As the doctor looked at the computer screen, he realized that his patient seemed exhausted. Sitting in front of the doctor was a boy named Yi Minjun, with a tired look. Minjun explained to the doctor that his exhaustion was due to having been doing this miserable job for a long time, so he asked if this was really the right way to live. While the doctor was entering Minjun's diagnosis on the computer, he said that Minjun seemed mentally exhausted like an elastic band that loses tension if pulled for too long. The screen of the computer displayed a syndrome called burnout, and the doctor told Minjun that his mind needed time to recharge. The doctor handed him a bottle of pills and said, you're not in a position to quit this job, so let's try as before. Minjun took the bottle of pills and with a tired look asked the doctor, how long will this last? The doctor opened his eyes, moved his ears, and told him that the next diagnosis would be in 23 years. Then he looked at Minjun with a confident look and said, of course it's a prescription for 23 years. After this, the doctor began writing the prescription on the computer and asked if he had any other questions. Minjun, tired, got up from the chair and said goodbye to the doctor. And as he headed towards the exit, the doctor raised his arms behind his head and also bid him farewell, saying see you in 23 years. As the doctor looked at the patient's diagnosis, with an uncertain expression, he began to wonder if there really was a way to live without working. But then he changed his thoughts and thought that there was no way Minjun could live without working. Minjun opened the door of the doctor's office and appeared in front of a park. This park was full of happy people enjoying a beautiful day. Minjun looked up at the sky and thought that today was a good day. At that moment, an alert alarm started ringing on people's cell phones. Minjun's phone also started ringing because he had a call. He took his phone out of his pocket and answered the call. It was a girl named Kathy who informed him about a bank robbery. Minjun asked about the payment, and she replied that the payment was the same as last time. After finishing the call, with a tired look, Minjun looked down at the ground and thought that this job was very boring. Then he was teleported near the bank where there were several police officers, and among the officers was an ogre with bright red eyes. Someone caught the ogre's attention, and when he turned around, he realized it was Minjun. He asked the ogre police if the suspect was really just one person. This ogre was Yimple, he confirmed that it was, and then Minjun approached him and whispered, You're a police inspector, you should relax your face. Yimple touched his head and nervously replied, This is my natural face. Then, Yimple explained that according to the last fugitive, there were a total of four hostages, and all of them were unconscious except for one. Before Yunpul could explain all the details, Minjun headed towards the entrance of the bank and informed him that he would now take control from this moment on. Yunpul, a little confused, asked him, take control of what? Minjun sighed and told him, I am going to take control of this case, and as he headed towards the entrance of the bank, Yunpul thought that there was no way an immigration office agent like him could handle this case alone. Once Minjun was near the entrance of the bank, he reached into his jacket and threw some magical seals into the air, and the magical seals started burning in blue flames. Upon seeing the seals and the blue flames, the people around them realized it was magic. Minjun looked at Yunpul and calmly told him that he was going to take action. Yunpul ordered the other officers, disperse the citizens, the immigration office will take control of this situation. One of the police officers approached Yunpul and asked, who is the magician that just entered the bank? Yungpul, a little surprised, replied that the magician was Minjun. The police officer was confused as to how Minjun was in charge of this case, so he asked Yungpul, isn't the immigration office in charge of illegal immigrants? Yungpul, a little disappointed at the police officer's question, asked him, what have you learned in school if you don't even know the difference between the immigration office and the immigration service? The police officer, with a ashamed expression, let out a sigh and explained to Yungpul that he had been sleeping during classes because he had been working night shifts. The police officer started crying to vent his sorrows and told Yunpul that he didn't even have enough time to earn money, so he couldn't find the time to study. Nervously, Yunpul thought to himself that he shouldn't have brought up the topic. He calmed the police officer down and decided to explain the difference between the immigration office and the immigration service. The immigration office dealt with complaints regarding foreigners, and a contracted agent from the immigration office like Minjun dealt with special foreigners, which was an entity that dealt with people who came from overseas. The police officer understood that inside the bank there was an illegal immigrant at another level. Inside the bank, a man in a white shirt was dragging a wounded elderly woman, and the man realized that an unwanted guest had entered the bank. Minjun entered the bank and began reading the report about an unemployed 31-year-old man named Nyo, who woke up and registered as a skilled user last year and used this opportunity to apply for a job in security companies. 
Just as Minjun was about to read Neo's special ability, a stretcher enveloped in green light came flying towards him at a high speed. With little effort, Minjun turned around and dodged the attack, and came to the conclusion that Neo possessed telekinetic ability. Then, Neo appeared in front of him and with a sinister look asked him, Did you relieve the police and come in alone? Minjun, with a calm voice, asked Neo, First, release the hostage. If you surrender right now, I promise not to kill you, and also warned him aggressively, If you make any move with the hostage, you will suffer the consequences. Right before Minjun could finish speaking, Neo interrupted him, saying shut up and do as I ask. Upon seeing Neo's attitude, Minjun issued one final warning, but Neo became angry and said, You have no right to treat me like garbage just because I'm unemployed. Neo began using his power to lift the furniture in the room, and then explained to Minjun that he thought his life would change after obtaining abilities, but the reality was very different, as he couldn't even find a job now. The worst part was that the government only gave him a measly $62 a month as an employment stipend. Through tears, Neo broke down, saying, My life is shit. At that moment, he remembered he had come to the bank to collect his job stipend, but an old lady approached him and said he had something on his back and tried to remove it. When the old lady touched his back, he felt immense pain, and now he couldn't remember what happened next. At that moment, the old lady, who was dragging Neo, lifted her head and started laughing, telling Minjun, You bastard, did you know who I was since you entered the bank? Neo regained consciousness and panicked, removing his hand from the old lady's neck, only to see tentacles draining his energy. With an evil smile, the old lady spoke to Minjun, saying, You have a keen sense, even though you're a dog of the immigration office. Minjun, with a cold expression, replied, I would be a fool not to realize that. The old lady stood up and realized Minjun hadn't been saying all those things without reason, as his words contained a spell to undo brainwashing. With a sinister look, the old lady stared at No and began using her powers to absorb his energy. Minjun rolled up his sleeves, unable to stand idly by in this situation. The old lady was Atrella Daphne, a wanted criminal from the Odin's dimension. She had three attempted murder cases, 12 murder cases, 49 cases of robbery involving contraband, and entered a primitive dimension without permission. She had committed so many crimes, not counting what she did on Earth. Minjun drew a dagger and said to Atrella, I gave you a chance, and you wasted it, cutting his hand and letting his blood flow onto the ground. Feeling Minjun's sinister aura, Itrella quickly realized that this bastard was a dark mage. The power of dark magic came from the pain of sacrifices by condensing absorbed life force. Dark magic was illegal in the country, but its use was allowed in cases of self-sacrifice for the public good or self-defense. The only downside to using dark magic was that the sacrifice life force could never be regained. While Atrella absorbed Neo's power, she began to wonder how much life force a mere human could gather. She planned to steal Minjun's power, just as she did with Neo, and without hesitation, she attacked him using all her power. Seeing this, Minjun began whispering words to activate the dark magic, just before Atrella's tentacle attack could reach him. An evil hand emerged from the ground and struck the floor, breaking all the tentacles near Minjun. A malevolent being appeared behind Minjun, and upon seeing this, Itrella was shocked and wondered, how is it possible for a single human to use such a large amount of dark magic? Minjun's hand changed color due to the loss of blood, and immediately Itrella realized that he had sacrificed decades of his life just to deal with her. Itrella, filled with fear and panic, asked Minjun, who are you? Minjun thought for a few seconds and then replied, I'm not sure. Itrella was not very sure of what Minjun was planning to do, but she was not willing to stand idly by. She prepared to attack again, but just before she could make a move, the evil being controlled by Minjun approached and with a simple movement, tore her body apart. Minjun approached Atrella's head, and she was paralyzed to see how powerful Minjun was. With her last strength, she asked Minjun, if you let me live, I will give you compensation in return. Confused, Minjun asked, what kind of compensation? Then Atrella asked him, do you know the reason why so many criminals gather on earth? She explained that according to the prediction of the best fortune teller in the dimension, there was a hidden fragment of an soul on earth, hidden by the world's worst criminal. This soul was in high demand, and she had a recording of a clue that led to this soul. Just before Atrella could finish telling him more information about the soul, Minjun interrupted her, saying, I don't need the fragment of the soul, because if I sell it, the committee will go after me, and besides, the reward would be much bigger than yours. Minjun touched his hair with his left hand and thought that this swindler was trying to deceive him even on the brink of death. Itrella looked at Minjun's left hand and was shocked, thinking it was impossible for him to regain life force in his arm, as according to the universal law, sacrifice life force could never be recovered. With her last strength, Itrella asked him, What race do you belong to? Minjun, showing no mercy, ended her life and responded, I don't know. After killing Itrella, 
Minjun deactivated the dark magic and started wondering, how many alien criminals have I killed? After thinking for several seconds, he couldn't remember the number and thought he was tired of doing this. Minjun looked at Nyo and was relieved to see that he was still alive. Then he looked at the pool of blood and thought that Atrella was going to be forgiven for robbing a couple of banks. Thinking about this, Minjun couldn't help but feel jealous of Atrella. After several minutes, the magical barrier protecting the bank building began to disappear, and then Minjun left. Seeing Minjun, Yungpul asked him, are you done already? Minjun confirmed that he was and then approached Yungpul, asking him to take care of the aftermath. Yungpul asked about the state of the hostages, and Minjun looked aside and told him they were alive. Upon hearing this, Yungpul felt relieved, as it would be very difficult for him to digest seeing a scene with a young man dead with a hole in his head. Minjun stared at Yungpul and told him, you have holes all over your body, then turned around and bid him farewell, advising him, you should change your mindset for this job. Minjun walked away from the bank, and after several minutes, his phone started ringing due to a new notification. Minjun took his phone out of his pocket and saw a notification about a transfer of 223,000 ones that Kathy had sent him. Minjun approached the road and extended his hand to stop a taxi, then he got in the taxi and headed towards Sengroksu's bookstore. According to public information, Minjun was the legendary agent of the immigration office with a 99% success rate in his cases. Minjun opened a system window, and according to the information the system had about him, he was sentenced to labor reform and also was under the effect of limited memory manipulation. But what many people don't know is that he was an alien disguised as a human. Long ago, Minjun committed a crime and was captured instead of being killed on the spot. His memories were erased from his body, and he was sentenced to labor reform. All the necessary jobs that were rejected by the public were assigned to people like Minjun who had altered memories. The job was like a prison, and leaving it was liberation. A system window appeared in front of Minjun and notified him of a deposit of 200 dalens. Every time he successfully completed a job in the field called Earth, he received a coin called Dalent. Another system window appeared, automatic transfer alert, 2000 Dalents withdrawn. Tax collector command center has been withdrawn from your account, periodic prisoner tax payment, balance, 2525 Dalents. Be careful, interest will be charged if your account goes negative. If the process is delayed for a period of time, you may be sentenced to death. Severance pay, immediate release bail of 5 million Dalents. The meaning of severance pay was a bit different from Earth's, as it was not the amount a person received upon retiring, but rather the amount they had to pay to retire. The reward Minjun had obtained for killing Atrello was only equivalent to a few thousand Dalents. The difficulty of earning Dalents was hell for prisoners. At that moment, Minjun thought that Atrello was probably thinking of stealing Earth's currency to convert it into Dalents to pay for her release so as not to end up in a state like his. The taxi driver looked through the rearview mirror and saw Minjun worried. Minjun was tired of this life, so he began searching for a new mission that would help him reach 5 million Dalents as quickly as possible. Most missions had a very small reward but among them was a mission called a SIF-1, which had a reward of 7 million Dalents. At that moment, Minjun remembered Atrella's words about the fragment of the soul and thought that if he completed this mission, he could become free. Minjun said aloud, this damn company, and upon hearing this, the taxi driver thought he was going through a rough time at work, so he advised him not to quit. Minjun replied, no, I will leave that place soon. I have worked there for too long. He had been working at that company for 800 years, but this time he was sure he would leave this damn company forever. Yumpel returned to the police department, and his boss asked him if he knew the three most effective ways to kill a superior immediately at work. Yumpel, a bit confused by his boss's question, replied, shooting them in the head, cutting their throat, or using skills. His boss pointed at him and told him that the answer was not correct. According to him, the true answer was, first, doing a half-done job to make them die of hypertension, second, creating disasters by doing a different job than assigned, causing them to get fired and starve to death, and third, ignoring the chain of command by saying nonsense about the boss, causing the immediate superior to stress to the point of developing cancer and dying. Yumpel, a bit annoyed by his attitude, asked, why is requesting more staff foolish? The area that Team 4 is responsible for is too dangerous to rely on civilian support. The boss stood up angrily and told him, that's your opinion, then relaxed and sat back down, handing some reports to Yunpul and telling him, get out of my sight. Yunpul took the reports and asked his boss what these reports were. His boss explained that now his team had to take care of the cases that had been assigned to Team 2. Upon looking at the reports, Yunpul realized that they were missing persons cases and without hesitation, he told his boss, my team doesn't have enough workforce to handle these cases. Upon hearing this, the boss angrily stood up and threw papers at his face, saying, if you don't have enough workforce, do it yourself. Then, he sat back down and asked him why orcs were so slow and frustrating. Yimpel was paralyzed for several seconds, then told his boss that he would get to work on the cases as soon as possible. 
At the same time, Minjun arrived at his office located on the top floor of Sangisku Bookstore. As he entered the office, a voice called out to him, and when he turned towards the voice, he realized it was his assistant Kathy. She asked Minjun, why don't you change your phone? I'm tired of sending so many messages. Then she took out her mobile phone and exclaimed, Minjun, you've become my second most contacted person. Minjun looked at the mobile phone and asked Kathy who the first person was. She became a bit nervous and replied that the first person was the credit card company. Minjun approached his desk and, upon seeing a box, he asked Kathy what it contained. Kathy pointed to the box with her finger and said, I picked it up on the way. Minjun opened the box and, upon seeing so many potatoes, he became somewhat confused and asked Kathy why a person living alone needed so many potatoes. Kathy responded, These potatoes are to share with a man who loves famine food. Minjun sat in his office chair and asked Kathy with what intention she had come to his office. She handed him a request and thought that he wouldn't take the case, so she explained that she had requested it herself from the immigration office. Minjun took the request and thought it must be something questionable, so he asked Kathy if this request was about a missing person. Kathy confirmed it and explained that the missing person was Jang Tijun, the president of Hyasung Industries. He had a net worth of 300 billion and hadn't shown up for work since last week, disappearing without a trace. The office suspected that this person was an undocumented alien living on Earth. Kathy took out a drawing of an alien and explained to Minjun that the office needed proof that Tijun was an alien so that the government could claim all his actions. Minjun looked at the report and asked Kathy if there was any air. Kathy approached him and told him that the president had no family and the only thing that existed was a will, but the office still had to obtain it. Kathy began to get even closer to Minjun, and he told her that it was possible to inherit even without being blood relatives, so he concluded that the government wanted to get their hands on the inheritance before the will was found. Minjun gave Kathy a gentle tap on the face to get her to move away a bit, and thought that if she had brought him something as boring as a missing person case, it was because the government was monitoring those actions. Minjun took the request and thought out loud that this could be a good idea to get rid of the debt. Kathy picked up one of the potatoes in her hand and as she looked at it, she thought that Minjun was a workaholic. Minjun left the building and greeted a small orc cleaning the outside of the bookstore named Dongchul. Dongchul looked at Minjun with admiration and called him master. Minjun got angry with him and told him, stop calling me master, just call me boss or Minjun. Nervously, Dongchul looked to the side and told him that the pronunciation was too difficult. Then he pointed to Minjun and told him that the boss was on the first floor and the master on the second, so it was very confusing for him. Minjun started to wonder why Lakefield had introduced him as the boss of the store. He turned around, entered the bookstore, and asked Dongchul not to call him master. Upon entering the bookstore, he saw a cactus and was amazed that Lakefield had been able to revive it. The bookstore owner, Sangroksu, called Lakefield, an elf race, who was sitting at the entrance, asked Minjun, what did you do to that cactus to make it like that? Embarrassed, Minjun replied, I had nothing to do with the plant, it was just a gift from Kathy. Upon hearing this, Lakefield got angry and asked him to stop bringing plants into his bookstore. Minjun sat down next to Lakefield and with a pleasant smile asked, is Dongchul doing a good job? Lakefield looked at Dongchul and replied, sure, he's doing well. Then Lakefield looked at Minjun and asked how he could help him. Minjun replied, I have to find someone, as it is your specialty. Lakefield was an American agent, so Minjun was not surprised to see that he had quickly discovered his intentions. Lakefield agreed to help him, and then Minjun handed him the request and said, in exchange for this request, I will reduce your rent for this month. Lakefield refused and said, there's no need, as I would practically not be paying anything. Then he extended his hand and summoned a small fairy. Minjun remembered that the fairy always took on the appearance of the person the summoner missed the most. Minjun was surprised to see that Lakefield was able to summon a fairy so quickly, and as he looked at the fairy, he asked Lakefield, what's your secret? Lakefield replied, concentration and practice, then he showed the fairy a picture of President Tijun and asked for help in finding him. The fairy nodded and flew away, Lakefield returned Minjun's request and told him that he would contact him when he had an answer from the fairy. In the evening, while Minjun was sitting in his office, Dongchul knocked on his door and informed him that the master wanted to see him. Minjun was surprised at the quickness of the spirit, so he quickly went to the bookstore and asked Lakefield if he had already found the person. Lakefield looked at him intently and replied yes, and then Minjun praised him saying, you're the best in this field. Lakefield calmly asked, why are you looking for this person? Minjun was somewhat confused by the question, so he replied, to interrogate him. Lakefield closed his eyes and said, take someone else with you. Upon hearing this, Minjun responded coldly, no way. Then Lakefield revealed that the person they were looking for was dead. Hearing this, Minjun asked, is that person a human? Lakefield stared into Minjun's eyes and replied, I'm not sure if you can call something like that a human. At nightfall, Minjun arrived at Tijun's corpse and called Kathy to inform her, saying, I've been searching, but the only useful thing I found was a letter in his pocket. 
apart from talk about the will, there's nothing useful. Minjoon also asked Kathy if the immigration office had found the will, and Kathy replied that she heard rumors that it was stored in the VIP safe deposit box at the Changchun Bank central office. Minjoon thought there was no way to access the will if it was in the safe deposit box, so he told Kathy, let's give up on the will and check President Tijun's house instead. Kathy thought this was a good idea, so she informed Minjoon that she would contact the office to file a visit request. Minjoon ended the call, and with a lost look, he thought, I should try to go back if it's going to be difficult to prove that Tijun is a foreigner. The next day, Minjoon went to President Tijun's house, and upon arrival, he found Yunpul waiting at the entrance. Then the guide came and told them that he had been thinking about what to do since they requested a visit. But now that he saw they already knew each other, he decided to give them the keys and asked them to return them once they finished inspecting the house. Yunpul told Minjoon, the guide has arranged a double reservation. Upon hearing this, Minjoon took out his phone and asked Yunpul to wait as he made a call to clarify the situation. Yunpul entered the house and said, there's nothing to clarify, I'm sure I only came to provide support. Yimpel became angry and clenched his fist tightly, saying aloud, I should have known that the damn team leader of Team 2 would ditch me. Minjoon also entered the house and asked Yimpel if another team had already taken this case before. Yimpel confirmed, explaining that there had recently been a wave of missing elves cases, so Team 2 was sent to the headquarters of Special Investigations and tasked with investigating the disappearance of a single person. The orcs were disappearing in masses every day, so Yimpel thought that the bastard leader had assigned him this case because he knew that the credit for Case 2 would go to his office. As Yumpul climbed the stairs of the house, Minjoon said to him, I'm glad they assigned you the case, and with a pleasant smile, he flattered him by saying, it's better to work with you than with someone else. Yumpul stopped, and while his phone was ringing, he thanked Minjoon for his words. He then checked his phone and saw that his boss was calling him. He answered the call and his boss said, there must be someone from the office there, they said just cooperate. Yumpul responded yes, then became furious and hung up the call. Minjoon calmed Yumpul by telling him that they would split the rewards after finishing the case. Yumpul refused to receive the reward because of their relationship, so he only asked him to invite him for a drink when they solved the case. Upon hearing this, Minjoon smiled and said, then let's earn some money for drinks. Both entered Tijun's house and began searching. Minjoon started to search the rooms, and Yumpul started searching the computers. After several minutes, while Minjoon was trying to reach a book on a shelf, Yumpul approached him and while holding a USB, he said, I made a copy of Tijun's hard drive, and I'll send it to you tomorrow. As they were talking, they began to hear a strange noise. Yumpul looked at Minjoon and asked if the sound did not resemble the scream of a sword. Minjoon asked him to be quiet, and while listening to the sound, he thought that this could be a clue to solve the case. Following the sound, they reached the kitchen and were confused to see that the sound was coming from a frying pan. Yimpel approached and took the frying pan, then asked Minjoon why the sound of a sword was coming from a frying pan. At that moment, Yimpel heard something strange, and without thinking twice, he threw the frying pan to the ground. Minjoon was very curious, so he approached Yimpel and asked if the frying pan had spoken. Yimpel confirmed that it had. Then Minjoon picked up the frying pan from the ground, and upon hearing some words coming from it, he threw it to the ground, just like Yunkel had done. Both stared at the frying pan intently, and after several seconds, Minjoon sighed and then picked up the frying pan and asked, Who are you? The frying pan started to talk and revealed that it was a great chef representing the Elodin dimension, and it also explained that it contained a partial copy of the memory of Dignav Alchatikyu, a kitchen utensil with built-in artificial intelligence. Minjoon gripped the frying pan tighter and started to stare at it aggressively. Previously, when Minjoon was inspecting Tijun's corpse, he thought that the culprits had done a very good job, as he realized that the corpse was a homunculus with the same DNA as Tijun's. He thought that if the government conducted a test, the result would be positive. While he was looking at the corpse, he began to wonder why someone would hang a fake corpse in the forest a week after his disappearance was reported. He was a little confused because he didn't know why someone would do this. If the death of human Jang Tijun was revealed, the beneficiary would be the heir who would receive the 300 billion, and the country would be the one losing out because it wouldn't be able to claim the wealth of an illegal foreigner. Even if Tijun was an alien and had hung the fake himself, for a company worth 300 billion, creating a homunculus was almost impossible. Since to create a homunculus, Tijun would have to be among the seven richest people in Korea or have the most advanced technology to make it possible. Now that a homunculus was involved in the case, Minjoon thought it was best to stay away from it, but then he thought it would be helpful if he could find some useful evidence from Tijun's house. Back to the present, the pan got excited and explained that it had been gathering dust for a long time because it hadn't had contact with anyone for a long time. Minjoon quickly realized that the ego integrated in the pan was top-notch and not something that could easily be found on Earth, 
so he became even more suspicious that Tijun was an alien. The pan started talking again and explained that it could see and record cultural elements within a 3 meter radius, so it was able to observe the ingredients to offer advice, and it could also communicate with people through mental connections. Minjun started to get tired of listening to the pan and began to doubt if he should throw it away. Minjun asked the pan if Tijun had ever used it. The pan blushed and answered that he used it very frequently. Yimpul, upon seeing that Minjun was able to hold onto the frying pan, was astonished. Minjun asked the frying pan if it could answer some questions about Tijun. The pan agreed to answer his questions but asked for a favor in return. Minjun brought the pan closer to his face and asked, what kind of favor? The pan blushed again and asked if he could throw it on the floor as it enjoyed this new stimulation. Minjun was somewhat shocked to hear this and without hesitation, he threw the pan on the floor. The pan then explained that Tijun seemed like a normal human from the moment it saw him until the end. Minjun sat on the floor, holding the pan, and asked, when was the last time you saw Tijun? The pan explained that it was about a week ago around 2 a.m. It saw him leave in the middle of the night and started wondering what kind of appointment he had to go out at that hour. The next day, the pan felt movement in the house, so it felt relieved and thought that nothing had happened. Minjun was surprised to hear this and asked Yimpul, has anyone entered the house since Tijun's disappearance? Yimpul responded, today is the first time the door of the house has been opened since Tijun's disappearance. At that moment, the pan revealed that it was not sure if that person was really Tijun because he always seemed to be searching the house and always left just before dawn. The pan also added that this person had come for five consecutive days. Minjun stood up from the floor and asked the pan if it had seen the face of that person. The pan replied that it hadn't, as it didn't have night vision, but explained that the person seemed like a human imitating Tijun's silhouette. Minjun told Yunpul that to enter and exit without using the door could only mean that the suspect had used magic wrap. Upon hearing this, Yunpul pointed to the pan and asked Minjun, what did it tell you? Minjun turned to Yunpul and explained that there was someone who had searched the house before them using magic wrap. Minjun activated his magic and said aloud, I have been searching for traces of magic in the present when I should have been searching for traces of magic in the past. The interior of Tijun's house turned black and white, revealing a trail of magic. Yimpul looked at the trail of magic, feeling confused, so he asked Minjun, what are you doing? Then Minjun approached him and explained that there was a spiritual world that overlapped with the material world, and magic always left a trace in the spiritual world. And now that he had activated the spiritual world, they just had to search for traces of magic wrap to find out who had entered the house before them. Minjun began to follow the trail of magic, and the pan told him that he was going in the right direction because the person imitating Tijun had passed through that area. After following the trail of magic, Minjun and Yumpul arrived at a room that contained 10 traces of magic wrap. Seeing the 10 traces of magic, Minjun explained to Yumpul that considering that these traces of magic were back and forth five times, it perfectly matched the pan's testimony. Then he approached one of the magic wraps and told Yunpul, let's try to follow it. Yunpul thought it was a good idea but asked, what are we going to do with the pan? Minjun responded that for now, it was better to take it with them because it was the only witness. They both left Tijun's house and Yunpul put the pan in the trunk. Seeing this, the pan thought it was being kidnapped to be enslaved. Yunpul got into the car, and upon hearing the sound of the pan, Minjun said to Yunpul, we should not touch the pan until we really need it. Yimpul started the car and asked Minjun if all magicians could see traces of magic. Minjun responded, not everyone, but I can because I have a lot of experience. While Yimpul was driving, he said, your life expectancy is quite long for being a quarter elf. Minjun asked Yimpul, so you're going to retire after five years. Yimpul confirmed it and said that orcs could age slowly, but everything was accumulating at once. Minjun smiled pleasantly and said, I'm not sure about other orcs, but you look fresh and fit, and also asked, would you like to work in my office once you retire? Yimpul smiled and said that according to the rules of his house, he must act within his means. Minjun asked if that meant yes, and Yimpul responded that if he joined his office, it would give his mother a heart attack. On the way, a truck with speakers giving a speech urging residents to vote for the human central party to reclaim the land approached them. Minjun rolled up the car window, and there was some tension in the air, so he decided to turn on the radio. After a few minutes, Minjun asked Yimpul to stop and explain that the trail of magic was splitting on this street. Yunpul got out of the car and told Minjun that this area was the orc community. Minjun also got out of the car and explained that the suspect must have made a temporary residence in this area since he had been going to Tijun's house every night for five days. And he also added that according to that reasoning, the neighborhood was the most appropriate for that. Minjun noticed that there was no trace of invisibility magic, so he asked Yunpul, you should check all the security cameras. The next day, Yunpul explained that there were no security cameras in this area because it was an orc community. While Minjun was opening the bag of drinking water, he said to Yunpul, it seems that this time I must use a traditional method. Yunpul was somewhat confused to hear this, so he asked, what is a traditional method? 
Minjun threw the plastic wrapper into the sky and said, and to think that a magician from the 21st century would do a manual investigation. Minjun and Yungpil went to an orc bar, and upon entering, Yungpil approached the bartender named Lee Tisum. Tisum was a little confused to see Yungpil, so he asked him, what are you doing here? Did you receive any reports? Minjun looked at Yungpil and asked, Do you know the bartender? Yungpil smiled and replied, This is also within my jurisdiction. Then Yungpil took out a photo and placed it on the counter, saying to Tisum, I've only come to ask a few questions. Have you seen this suspicious person around here lately? Yungpil handed the photo to Tisum and explained that the suspect had a similar appearance to the person in the photo and operated primarily at night with a distinct magical scent. Tisum took the photo in his hand and began to think. He then went into a room to make a call and asked Yungpil, wait here, I'll be right back. Yungpil looked at Minjun and said that if this guy didn't know anything about the suspect, it meant he was not in the area. After several minutes, Tisum returned and handed the photo back to Yungpil. He explained, an orc has seen someone similar to the person in the photo in the third district. Minjun looked at the photo and started whistling, thinking that this was going to be easier than he had thought. After that, Minjun and Yungpil went to the third district and started asking people if they had seen any suspicious individuals in the area. Thanks to the information they gathered, they arrived at some buildings. Yumpel then told Minjun that the orc community had poor security, so people rarely went out at night. Both of them began to look at the buildings, and Yumpel explained to Minjun that it was very difficult to determine on which floor the suspect might be, as he only came out at night. Minjun stared intently at one of the floors and told Yumpel, We've found the suspect. Activating his magic, he began to see all the traces of magic converging at a point called the Warped. As they approached the door of the suspect's house, Minjun noticed that it was filled with magical barriers. He explained to Yumpul that the suspect didn't possess magic, hence the extensive security measures. He took out his dagger and attempted to break one of the barriers, but at that moment, he pulled back his dagger and realized that the suspect was very intelligent. Minjun asked Yumpul to stay behind as the suspect was attempting to escape. He then activated his dark magic and swiftly broke through all the magical barriers. Upon seeing Minjun's dark magic, Yumpul was impressed. The door to the suspect's house collapsed, and they saw a man near a magic wrap. The man put his hand into the magic wrap and mocked them, saying, Did you really think you could catch me? Upon seeing this, Yumpul quickly ran towards the man to prevent his escape. But at that moment, Minjun used his dark magic and just before the man could enter the magic wrap, he grabbed his feet and pulled him out of the portal. The man was astonished by this. Minjun then wrapped the man's body with his dark magic and left him on the ground. Yungpil was amazed at how powerful Minjun was. After that, they tied the man to a chair. Yungpil noticed the tattoo on the man and realized he was a member of the society. Minjun stared at the man's tattoo and asked Yungpil, isn't the society a criminal organization formed by ability users? Yungpil confirmed, explaining that it was a place where only the scum gathered. Yungpil checked the criminal's phone but couldn't find anything useful, and Minjun searched the room but found no clues either. Yungpil grabbed the criminal's shoulder and explained the crimes he had committed and the punishment that awaited him. The criminal spat in Yungpil's face and said, Go to hell. You're not even human, you're just a bastard pretending to be one because you're wearing a police uniform. I'm so angry, I'm going to destroy your face. Minjun looked at Yungpil and said, I can't help you if he talks to you like this. Yungpil nodded and grabbed the criminal by the neck and pulled out a hammer. Seeing the hammer, Minjun asked him, why are you taking out the hammer? Yungpil looked at Minjun and asked, isn't it your style? And while Minjun was holding a knife, he told Yungpil, put the hammer away, I have something much better. Confused, Yungpil asked him, do you mean the knife? Minjun put away the knife and asked him to look closer. He had a grain in his hand, and from that grain emerged a purple fly. The criminal, upon seeing the fly, became terrified. Minjun realized that the criminal knew what the fly was for, so with a cold expression, he asked, Are you willing to cooperate? The criminal looked at the ground and tremblingly called him an idiot. Seeing that the criminal had no intentions of cooperating, Minjun threw the fly into the man's face, and in the blink of an eye, the fly quickly entered his nose. Then, Minjun asked Yungpil for the recorder, and he handed it over while the criminal suffered from immense pain that grew more intense. Minjun turned on the recorder and then approached the criminal, whispering a dark magic spell to activate the fly. Yungpil asked Minjun, what is this fly? Minjun turned to Yungpil and replied, this fly is a happy bug that directly stimulates the adversary's brain, forcing the release of dopamine and providing the most stimulating feeling of happiness. While holding the recorder, Minjun explained to Yungpil, I recorded the spell on the recorder, so now we can use the fly for a long time. Several hours later, as evening approached, the criminal woke up due to the sound of a dripping faucet and began to scream. Then, he tried to free himself and told Minjun, I don't like this place, let me go back to my happy place. Minjun approached the criminal and asked, shall we start again? 
He then showed him the recorder and asked, Do you want to go back to the happy memories? The spell to control the happy bug is inside the recorder. If you want the recorder, then tell me everything you know about Tia June's disappearance. Without much thought, the criminal began to reveal information and said, I don't know where Tijun is. I only had to find the secret vault hidden in Tijun's house using magic to transfer everything from inside to the client. Minjun looked at the criminal and was somewhat surprised, as he had also searched Tijun's house but couldn't see anything resembling a vault. Minjun asked the criminal, who is your client? The criminal became nervous and with a trembling voice replied, I don't exactly know who the client is, but I have an idea of who it might be. The criminal revealed the name of the person he believed to be the client, and upon hearing this, Yunpo grabbed the criminal by the neck and told Minjun, this bastard is lying. Upon hearing this, the criminal exclaimed, I'm telling the truth, and this information has been confirmed by headquarters. Yunpo looked at Minjun and asked, What are you going to do now? Are you going to continue? This is too dangerous. Minjun put his hand on his chin and began to think about the reasons why the client could be a dragon. Upon seeing that Minjun didn't respond, Yunpo called him again, but he continued not to answer as he was lost in his thoughts. With a distant look, Minjun thought that the dragons were those who ascended to the top of the Earth's hierarchy in just one generation. It wasn't one or two people who had suddenly disappeared for offending the dragons. The dragons were a powerful figure that controlled society with immense wealth and power. Minjun snapped out of his trance and told Yunpo, First, we must ask him more questions. Several hours later, a team of police officers arrived at the criminal's apartment, and as the police took the arrested criminal away, Minjun told one of the officers, I know you don't want to hear my words, but at least listen to the recording and follow the rules. Yunpo watched as the police took the criminal away and asked Minjun, Will this guy stay in that state? Minjun replied, You should stop thinking about him. He's just enjoying a happy buzz. He then praised Yungpul, saying, Reporting to the police was a good move. Seeing the mental state of the criminal, Yungpul asked Minjun, Normally, they would die immediately, right? Minjun confirmed it and said, If they can receive proper treatment, the survival rate is around 50%. Minjun thought to himself that the percentage still depended entirely on how the person was affected by the potion. Both got into the police car, and Minjun turned on the radio. Along the way, he thought that most dragons didn't bother with that kind of thing, so he ruled out many candidates and concluded that there were only four possible candidates now. Still, Minjun couldn't guess the dragon's motives. At that moment, a news report on the radio informed them that Hyasung Industries had reached a limit in its stock price due to the news of a share purchased by the company, with a 15% market capitalization. This was a record for Hyasung Industries on the stock market, at first, Minjun and Yunpul didn't pay much attention to the news, but when they heard the name Hyasung Industries, they were shocked because it was the company of the missing President Tijun. Minjun looked at Yunpul and asked, Is it normal for them to handle such important matters when the boss is absent? Yunpul didn't have much knowledge about companies, so he replied, Maybe Tijun approved it before he disappeared. Several minutes later, they arrived at Minjun's office, and according to the information given to them by the criminal, Minjun had returned to Tijun's house again to see if he could find the secret vault, but no matter how much he searched, he couldn't find it. And the frying pan also didn't give them any answers, so they returned to the office to discuss what they should do next. Minjun sat down on the sofa and started looking at the ceiling. Then he threw a piece of paper into the air and told Yunpul, let's give up. Even if a dragon is involved, we have more to lose than to gain. Minjun thought about going to the immigration office the next day to contact Kathy. At that moment, Kathy entered his office and upon seeing Yunpul, she asked Minjun, why is Uncle Yunpul here? Yunpul got a little annoyed and asked Kathy, why do you call me uncle? Kathy touched her hair and replied, I call you that because of your face. Seeing the frying pan, Kathy approached the table and asked why there was a frying pan in the office. Minjun told her, I recommend you not touching the frying pan because it's dirty. Ignoring his words, Kathy hesitated and picked up the frying pan. At that moment, Moment, the frying pan started talking and greeted her. Surprised to see that the frying pan was talking, Kathy realized that the frying pan was an ego. The frying pan told Kathy, you can call me brain dead. Upon hearing this, Kathy sighed and said, it's not right to call someone that, don't you have another name? The frying pan revealed its true name, Dignav Alchatiku, and upon hearing its true name, Kathy became confused as she couldn't pronounce it. Minjun looked at Kathy and told her, don't even think about taking the frying pan. Kathy approached Minjun and, seeing his expression, asked, have you had any problems? Minjun looked away, changed his expression, and said, no, we don't have any problems. Immediately, Kathy realized that something had happened, so she felt relieved because she had brought some alcohol. Minjun and Yunpul refused to drink alcohol, and upon seeing this, Kathy took out a bottle from Kingsley Aston's Dwarf Maestro collection, aged 37 years. Minjun and Yunpul distanced themselves from her and started discussing the food they were going to order. But in the end, both Yungpul and Minjun ended up drinking alcohol. 
That same night, Minjoon woke up in the middle of the night feeling like he was dying and thought it was because he was intoxicated. At that moment, Minjoon opened his eyes within a dream and thought that he felt bad because he had a bit of a hangover. While walking through the dream, he began to wonder, why did I drink alcohol? Did the crown prince of the Graham Empire force me? Then he remembered that it had been more than 250 years ago. Then he wondered, is it because of the necromancer's curse? But then he recalled, at that time, it was because I had just started working. While walking through the dream, he saw a door with a bright light, and as he extended his hand, he woke up lying on the floor. He then thought deeply, now I am human June and I am on earth. Dong Xiao appeared in front of his face and said, Good morning, I brought you the mail. Minjun started reading the mail, and among all the mail, there was a request for assistance letter from Jenkinson. The letter asked Minjun to go to the president's secretary's office as soon as possible to receive a new message regarding his current mission. After several hours, Minjun arrived at the Jenkinson Company building, and some guards guided him inside. As he made his way to the president's office, he thought, have I been called because of what Yunpul and I discovered the other day? Minjun entered the president's office and encountered the elf secretary with green hair named Blair. Well, this is the end of the part 1, if you want to see a part 2, don't forget to subscribe and comment the word part 2.